have a question. Bill, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well. Uh, this, uh, this day creates energy, so um, I feel very alive. Wonderful. <laughs> And I have a question for you, Frederick. How are you? <laughs> I'm really well. I, um, I have a day off. I have a very good friend with me the whole day from France. And so, um, and so this is a, a wonderful, soulful day for me. You know, a simple way for me to, to think about it is, um, is to invite all the parts of me into into the conversation um into the relationship with others with a spouse with children with uh um at work um and in so many places and settings something feels slightly unsafe something feels like we might be judged and so we we feel like we we need to show certain parts and hide other parts um, you know, and it's in, incredibly subtle. It's, it's uh, these things of, you know, this, uh, we are having this, this call and, uh, and just before I came, I was wondering, you know, is, 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 this, is this good enough? Is this formal enough? Is this, you know, maybe I should be, you know, and, you know, there's, there's all these little voices of, um, of fear in us that make us think that, hey, maybe I should be wearing this, maybe I should be saying this, maybe I should be showing myself in, in this way. Um, and so wholeness, it, to me, one way to look at it so very simply is to, is to accept all of these voices and then and then try to to go somewhere deeper. Hard to improve on. Uh, I was thinking some of the same things, uh, and but I spend most of my time uh, just in a very small part of myself or different small parts of myself at different times. So one of the most important things for me, just on a personal level, and this doesn't speak to all the other kinds of wholeness, but um, has been to have a, an exercise that every time I think to try it, um, it's always relevant because, in fact, I'm only in a very small part of myself. Um, uh, so I, the way I introduce the larger parts of myself is to try to um, divide my attention between really having the scene in front of me come alive, uh, that I should actually see the colors and that I should actually see the facial expressions of the people that I'm with. Uh, and then uh, while maintaining that liveness, also try to uh, include uh, the, the sensation inside my body. How is it actually feeling now to have to contort my neck this way when I actually have a difficulty with a stiff neck? Uh, so I'm aware, very aware of the sensation inside myself. Um, and against those uh, awarenesses, uh, the different thoughts become more visible. Just because I'm more aware of these things outside, now I'm not so caught by the thoughts. Um, and I notice that there is a kind of a tension that can include the outside world, my sensations, and my thoughts. Um, and I've lost that attention most of the time. Uh, how can I include it more of the time? Um, and over the years of trying this, sometimes dozens of times a day, in the middle of meetings and other times, I've come to find that uh, finding the energy in the hara and uh, continuing to feel it is the way to, for me at least, uh, to remain a little more present. So very, very gradually, uh, a, a greater sense of wholeness uh, comes. But, uh, and then you begin to be aware of how afraid you are the way uh, uh, Frederick was just saying uh, all the little fears that are running through about how you look and uh, haven't you just taken three times as long as Frederick to answer this question and <laughs> isn't it getting a little too long? It's almost as, for me as if there were two levels. You know, one level is 
you know, can I allow myself to, to be in more wholeness when I'm with others? You know, can we create workplaces where people feel safe enough to, to show up more of who, who they are? But then I think there's even a level where it's only in community of others that we can actually really discover ourselves, that we can actually really discover all of whom we are. We can't discover that alone. And so there are some wonderful workplaces where wholeness really goes both ways. It allows me to show up with all of whom I already know that I am, but then it helps me discover parts of me that I didn't even know existed and include them. Um, sometimes I, I, I try to bring this, um, this, this analogy or this little um, reminder, you know, talking about wholeness often is a difficult concept and, you know, um, and many people say, but you know, I most, you know, I'm the same at work than I am at home. And, um, and then I, I, I try to invite them to, to say, you know, think back the last time you really had a wonderful conversation with a friend, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You know, often, you know, these things, you know, when they really are magical moments happen at, in the evening, at night, and, you know, everything gets dark around, and, and we somehow dare to go to wonderful, deep places, and we, we, we feel that we could just say everything we wanted to say. We could show really vulnerable places. We, wouldn't, we weren't judged. And, and most people, most of us have, have had some of these really magical moments. Um, and that's just one way to approach it and say, how would it be if, if we had workplaces where we could approach this, this kind of presence in everyday, in everyday life? And, you know, in these conversations with friends, what makes them often magical is we discover ourselves in the conversation. It's by going through to places into real vulnerability that we understand stuff, that we discover stuff, that the other helps us see something in ourselves that we hadn't seen. And so in this, in this way, you know, at, at, at their best, workplaces can be places of, of real self-discovery, of places where while we do the outer work of the organization, we also do inner work at the same time. And, and that to me is really quite fascinating when we can touch that, when we can get there. Well, even though we try to uh, put words on different kinds of transformations that organizations and people can go through, uh, and as Frederick is emphasizing, relationships can go through. Um, and in fact, I, I've come to think that the paradigm relationship for interindependent is the friendship. It's not the company, it's not the family, uh, it's the friendship um, where we maybe most often have these kinds of self-discovering conversations. But it, even if we have some theoretical words for the later uh, action logics, uh, it, they are really unimaginable from the place we are. They first, they have to be experienced, uh, and they're often experienced in surprising and, you know, uh, you, yeah, you never, you never expected to have that happen in the conversation where it first happens. I can remember the conversation with my brother, who's two years younger, when we were in our early 20s, and we had our first con real, real conversation about our relationship all the way to the bottom. And what a bully I had been. I didn't think I was a bully. I wasn't really a bully. It was, uh, but anyway, we talked about all of what uh, each stirred up in the other. And um, it really, I think, changed both of us, not only in our relationship, but just, oh my gosh, you can have this kind of conversation with someone. and I began having it, finding it was happening more and more. So, uh, so that's one element of transformation is this peculiar thing that it's really unimaginable before you experience it. As you were asking the question, I was reflecting on the fact that it's a word that I, I don't use. I, I don't think I've, I've used it in the book and it's, it's not a word I, I typically use. And so I was wondering, hey, how, how come it, um, and I guess that what I often associate with the word transformation or the way it's often used is it's as, as if something was added to you, as if you went into a new space, as if you, 
And what, what I've experienced, at least in, in my own life, is that you know, what could be called transformation is often just letting go of stuff. It's going towards more truth. It's going towards, towards more depth, towards stuff that was already there that I just couldn't see. And so it's not like I'm, I'm really traveling. It's not like I'm going to a new place. It's not like, like new stuff has been happening to me, right? Because the transformation is often like you are transformed. So something else is transforming you or, you know, you're, you know, let's transform this organization. And, and I find it's interesting to try to see how can we evoke that which is already there and has been often longing to express itself for a long time you know, has been knocking and has been wanting to, to be seen and, and hasn't been seen, and that, that I'm suddenly allowing to see. Like if I, I could, in many ways, you know, the conversation, Bill, that you had with your brother had been seated for a long time, had been, you know, I imagine had been there for a long time. And it, it just at some point it happened. You, you didn't learn a new technique. You probably didn't come out of a workshop that told you how to have a conversation with your brother. You know, it, it was already there. I think there's many, again, of course, ways to look at this and answer the question. I, I think one way that I like to look at is, is this question of, of control that's often behind this or this question of fear, right? So, so we, we, you know, as a leader, we sense a longing to do things differently. We feel that the current way of doing it doesn't quite do it anymore. Um, but then we're afraid of, of all the control we will have to give up in this new, in this new way. Right, because it suddenly looks like we'll have to trust people, and you know we'll have to give up all of our traditional top-down and command and control kind of levers that we have on people and on the organization. And so that's often, you know, the the, the fear that comes up. And um, and I, I think one of the obvious ways then is to is to simply acknowledge that fear in us, or if we're working with leaders, is simply to acknowledge that fear. And say yes, of course. We, you know, we're stepping into a new space, where different rules, and you know the old rules. You don't know the new rules, and so you know, what is the, you know, what is this voice of fear, and what is really the fear that you're having? What is the control that you feel that you're you're going to give up? Um, and what is your longing behind that? Um, and I, I think it's when you start recognizing this fear that you can that you can work with it, and that you can at some point put it next to you or or behind you. And there's, a, there's lots of very rational answers that you can give. And I often have discussions about how in these new systems that are much more self-organizing, there is actually much more control than in the old top-down systems. And so you can give a lot of rational answers for that. Um, but I think there's also this emotional journey that we have to work with as individuals or if we work with leaders to just name that fear and, and, and have it be okay that that fear is there, that this desire to be in control is there. Well, we uh, had a very uh, engaged conversation in the open space uh, period just before lunch uh, in which one of us who convened the conversation was presenting uh, his difficult moment in the midst of uh, an absolutely necessary change in the organization, but one that a lot of people were afraid about and fearful to to join in, and um, he very honestly uh, said at one point when asked, uh, I think something like, um, "When did the listening begin?" Because we were talking about listening rather than telling before, uh, and uh, I think he said, "It hasn't begun yet." Uh, so that that was a very fresh uh, response and honest, um, but I think we talked a lot about this difficult transition period and, uh, and the fact that uh, in an organization used to a great deal of unilateral power being exercised, um, there were all sorts of fears of the loss of that power uh, and that it is a tricky, a very tricky uh, intermediate period. Um, uh, there will inevitably be mistakes, and actually, 
uh, it's almost necessary or useful to have these mistakes because um, because that has to become part of the culture that mistakes can be made, can be recognized, can be discussed. Um, so, but of course, the fear initially is there will be mistakes. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, yes, there will be. Um, but there, there will also be moments where there has to be some kind of combination of unilateral control and uh, collaborative inquiry. Um, that there are that there are real boundaries that the interests surrounding the organization uh, seem to require at this time. Maybe they can be inquired into, but they haven't been yet. Um, so uh, there is a tremendous leadership skill, I believe, in uh, making making this transition, and it partly means uh, involves becoming more familiar with the mutual forms of control and how much more satisfying they are and how much easier they are to use, it's also uh, important to realize that through unilateral control, you can never actually generate, a, you, can, you cannot force a person or a system to transform. They might conform to your vision and look like they're doing what you say, but there's this division then, what they're really thinking and feeling and how much they're really engaged. Uh, so there's an additional form of power that mutual power brings uh, that uh, simply isn't available to unilateral power, but that's mostly invisible because there's so little experience of, of recognized transformation going on in organizations. You know, when you're saying mistakes will happen and they're actually even necessary. Um, sometimes when I speak with leaders, I tell them, but it's, it's not like mistakes aren't happening now, is it? And they all start laughing, right? Um, it, it's funny because they contrast the, the potential risks with what is ideal in the current situations. But then they complain all the time that there's lots of mistakes. You know, it's not like unilateral power prevents you from all sorts of bad things happening. Right? So sometimes just bringing that perspective helps them to see, you know, hey, I'm looking for something that's totally fail-safe when I have a mess now already. Right? Um, uh, the other thing that I, I have found sometimes helps is to acknowledge that control isn't a bad thing. So there's sometimes this misunderstanding when you talk about these new organizational forms that there should be no more control. Everything should just be trust and everything should just be free and there should be no more processes and, you know, which in, in my perspective simply isn't true. Um, you know, if you look at, if you take the metaphor that of these organizations as living systems, you know, in, in living systems, there's lots of control. There's lots of processes. You know, if a, if a virus is entering my body, there's lots of, you know, very good systems in place to very quickly identify that, that virus and then do something about it. Right. Um, and so um, and so the nature of some of the stuff that happens in organizations requires very tight processes. You know, in the, in the book I write about Morningstar, the tomato guys, you know, that transform tomatoes into into ketchup. You know, that, that it's just a very rigorous process. At that step in the process, the tomato needs to be exactly at 87.5 degrees and it needs to be at that pressure and at that you know, viscosity. And 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 so you need and want some control. Um, simply, it's a control that is, is no longer, you know, the sort of unilateral power, but it's coming from um, from mutual power. You know, if, to use the, the words that you just you just used, and that I think um, helps a lot of people to understand that their desire for control isn't them being wrong or them still sticking to an old paradigm, but that part of that is a very natural thing. Systems need to be in control for some parts. And other parts can then very well be in chaos. And so starting to be able to distinguish what naturally calls for control and what are some of the controls we've built in that aren't necessary. I don't know, there's all sorts of HR processes, all sorts of, you know, where we've just built rigid processes that actually don't serve us, that are just purely bureaucratic. And those ones we can get rid of them. But then there are other areas where we actually do need control. Um, and so just recognizing that I think helps a lot of leaders to say, hey, okay, so, so I, I I wasn't wrong. There wasn't something wrong with me when I was listening to, to the need for, for control.
Here's my thing. I, I think that very often that question just hides a fear from leadership by saying, hey, you know, the people at the bottom of my pyramid aren't ready for this. You know, I have in my organization, lots of people want to be told what to do. And, you know, I don't, I don't see them stepping up to. Um, so in, in many cases, I challenge that. Um, what you find in organizations that were traditionally managed and then at some point had a leader that initiated a change towards more self-organizing is that almost everyone at the bottom of the organization makes it. It's, there's a real learning process and for some of them it's difficult in the beginning and you know I, um, but and what, what leaders of these organizations tell me is that people at the bottom, you know, to use that expression, you know, all of them in their private lives take important decisions. They all decide, you know, if they will get married, if they will get divorced, uh, if they have children, what school to, tell the, to send their children to, um, to buy a house and where to get a mortgage. So it's not like these people can't make important decisions. So what makes us think that in the workplace they wouldn't be able to do that and to take responsibility. And so what they found is that the percentage of people who really leave because they say, I can't do this, this is too much, I just want to be told what to do, that percentage is really, really low. And those are the people who also in their private lives will have very tough times managing their own finances or doing their own. But almost everyone can, can do it. Actually, the much bigger question is people in, in middle and senior management and in staff functions, and there, apparently, the percentage of people who leave is much bigger. Because for, for them, they were used to exercising power in a certain way. And for them to reprogram themselves is often much bigger. And some of them then just leave and say, hey, I want to go be a manager in, in a traditional organization. So this, this is not for me. But so the question of actually people not stepping up to their, their power and their responsibility, that level, that apparently seems not to be such a big issue. Now, now I'm just talking from what I hear in practice and I'm very curious, Bill, you more from your research perspective um, on, on individual levels, wh whether that makes sense to you or if you would add something to that. Well, we were discussing this a little bit too in the uh, event before lunch. Um, and I think, it, yeah, it is very difficult to tell the difference initially uh, from what people say when they are relatively in a fear culture, uh, and then what they can say when they don't feel so much as though they're in a fear culture. So uh, often just changing the nature of the groups and the nature of the time in which to meet and discuss these questions um, can, uh, uh, can help those people come out relatively rapidly that we might otherwise uh, think we're too afraid to engage. We, I also mentioned that it's often helpful uh, in a specific case for everybody to think a little bit about what they want to preserve in the organization as it changes. Uh, and very often uh, it's possible for people to agree on some very meaningful aspect of the organization uh, that has sustainable validity and carries a kind of spirit that matters to people, uh, and that once knowing that we are mutually committed to uh, making that part of the enduring practice of the organization, uh, we're quite open to other changes. So that, that's a, a way of, of approaching uh, and, and diminishing the fear. But I like, uh, I like your point about the, uh, the fact that it is particularly difficult for people who have had uh, positions of relative power in a, in a pyramid that uh, they actually have the most difficult uh, retraining. And it certainly was true in the first uh, organization I ever led, which was for students who were so difficult to deal with at the high school level that they were typically thrown out of school every day uh, by uh, every week when they came back for the new week. Uh, before they could get in the school, the vice principal would throw them out uh, because they were just too much trouble to have in class. Uh, but actually, in the summer residential sessions, um, they were quite excited to be involved. They were a little unruly, um, 
but it was the staff that had the more difficult, uh, uh, greater difficulty adjusting to creating classrooms and schools and a discipline committee that had students on it. Um, and uh, the staff using power in a different way was probably the single most difficult issue. Mm -hmm. um, well, that is what I mentioned um, earlier at the end of the morning session here that, you know, uh, we had some research that really seemed to support that if the CEO is unable and unwilling to model the vulnerability of sharing power, uh, that it uh, becomes uh, virtually impossible for the organization to go ahead. Even if there are several other, say, members of the senior team or directing team who may be at a later action logic, uh, their own initiatives, especially when things get tight and fearful, and that CEO uh, becomes fearful, uh, that it's very hard to unblock that, um, and uh, that it does often, in those cases, require a change of the CEO uh, before the system will really change. So I think that there is this paradox that in the movement to more shared leadership from directive leadership, there is a kind of leadership that's required that is the most difficult of all that uh, both to a certain degree uses unilateral power, but also knows how to model and represent uh, mutual power, and particularly knows how to show vulnerability uh, in, in public. After re reading some of your research, Bill, I, I often thought, you know, if, if, a, if a board was really clever when they appoint a CEO, you know, they should really look at the action logic <laughs> of, <laughs> of their candidates, right? <laughs> Because that would be as good a predictor of, uh, of success than whatever skills or experience or background that they have, right? Um, and unfortunately, of course, few boards yet are, are, are steeped in this thinking. Um, but, right. But, but, Although, uh, I would also immediately caution that just because one has a transforming action logic does not mean one will be a good CEO. Because, uh, of course, it also depends on experience working with organization. So there are contextual factors, uh, sort of horizontal knowledge one needs to be successful, but that's right. Now that's all that people look at when they hire somebody, uh, and uh, it would probably be very helpful if they had a dialogue about how important is this other factor. I think that's the, the paradox that Bill was just alluding to, right? And um, um, it's interesting when I was writing this book, when I thought about these leaders, uh, founders, or, or CEOs that took over an existing organization and changed it that I researched, is, you know, I call them CEOs, even though, you know, they, they, their role fundamentally changes. Um, and so what they do is much, much less deciding and strategizing and, you know, chairing executive committees. So in that sense, they're much less powerful than traditional CEOs. I mean, they take many fewer decisions, they're in many fewer meetings. But in other ways, they're much more needed, they're much more critical, because they need to hold the space for something that isn't, that is still very countercultural, or that isn't, you know, that, that goes against the assumptions that so many people have, that most of us have in our heads, right? And, and so, one of the things they all insisted upon is that every time something goes wrong, every time there's a problem, somebody's voice in the organization will want to go back to the old way. Will say, hey, we need another control mechanism. Hey, we need another level of bureaucracy. Or we need another level of hierarchy. Or we should have somebody sign off on this. Or we should, right? And so always they had to go back. No, 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 no. Remember. Remember our fundamental assumptions. Remember how we do this. You know, this is, this is how we do it. This is our space. And you know, will respond in, none, in another way. And so in that sense, they were much, much more needed. And so this is this, this enormous paradox. Um, and my hypothesis is that maybe in 10, 20, 30, 50 years, when this will become much more mainstream, that role will not be needed as much. 
because many more people will have these natural reflexes and instincts that, that go with this. But, but for now, we need this, at least this one person, ideally more, that really hold the space for, for those kind of, of practices. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd want to add at this point also, though, that in the spirit of interindependence, it's so critical to begin building a team of allies for holding the container and the change. Um, and there's no CEO who's at the top of the system by himself or herself. There's always a, a, an outside board and uh, often outside public interests or um, uh, in my case, when I was a graduate dean uh, at Boston College, uh, yes, I had control over the immediate graduate program, uh, but no control over faculty promotions or other things that you might think were critical to getting the right team around me. It was also, I was coming to an Irish, Catholic, Italian uh, university Jesuit, and uh, I was a white Anglo-Saxon Ivy League uh, person who was really viewed as outside the culture there. And it was absolutely critical for me and my success uh, that the dean of the whole school uh, became a very close friend and supporter, and also the executive vice president of the university uh, who for some reason was willing to have lunch with me every six weeks. And he was probably the, uh, the senior non-academic person at the university who had a great deal of credibility. Uh, my dean was so smart that he, uh, we would always have these private meetings, uh, but then he would say, you know, don't expect me to support your proposal immediately in the faculty meeting. I'm going to be your toughest opponent because he didn't want to just create this in-group. Uh, he wa wanted to be able to represent the rest of the faculty as well. So uh, we often had these encounters uh, in public that were both serious because he, he wasn't easy on me or he would pick something that I didn't know he was going to pick. I mean, he'd really um, hit me upside the head. But at the same time, I, I absolutely knew he was my ally in the end, and uh, he would come through. So those, those relationships uh, were absolutely key to my being able to have a sustained success, uh, even though I was the public, uh, publicly, I was the leader who was taking the steps. I think it, it helps tremendously just to start recognizing it, right? I mean, the first thing that we typically do with fear is that we rationalize it away or we push it away because being in fear feels fearful <laughs> and it feels uncomfortable and we don't like to do that, right? And so um, just for myself, naming the fear or when I'm with leaders, allowing them to feel that fear and simply say that fear is okay. You know, it points to something important. It points to an important thing to be discussed. Um, and so if we don't listen to it, then, 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 we're, then we're bound to make mistakes. Um, so I, I think that is for me um, a really a big, big part is simply naming it, stepping into it, um, and making it be okay that the fear is there. Right? Um, and what becomes even more interesting, I find, is, is if, if we can start talking about fears in groups, you know, if an executive committee can start talking about their fears, because it's already a big step for me to acknowledge my own fear with myself or maybe with a coach or, you know, a consultant. But then when the, the whole team can finally drop that mask and that guard and just all say, hey, we're fearful. We don't exactly know what we're stepping into. Um, and that's okay. And, and suddenly there's often something, oh, what everyone else is, is fearful okay <laughs> and suddenly there's something where already a lot of it a lot of it drops um, so for me it's, it's, it's really going into that emotional space before we go potentially into then rational discussions about hey you know what are, what are really the areas where we're fearful where where do we need to assert control where do we need to make sure that we keep some some of the old mechanisms in place before we transition to a new and then we can have all sorts of interesting and important discussions but but if i think until we acknowledge 
the fear on the emotional level, uh, we, we, we can't go into that space in, in any meaningful way. Right, there's a, uh, well, there's long been a, a first person research process um, uh, in the United States that has a, a, an unfortunate name, it's called focusing and it makes it sound like it's something you do with your eyes or it's like bringing a clear thought into view. But it's also called uh, finding the felt sense. So it's really um, consulting your body and taking some time to ask what are the feelings you're feeling uh, right now without knowing why you're feeling them or what the relevance is to what's going on. Uh, and then just waiting for those feelings to focus themselves, to, for, for words to come out of the feelings rather than projecting words onto the feeling from the mind. Uh, and I think that's related to everything you're saying now, Frederick, in terms of, its, of, of, of consulting the feeling and allowing it to emerge, and it kind of transforms into something else as it emerges. And as somebody said somewhere today, it, it does become less fearful, among other things. Uh, that's all I have to add right now. It's so interesting, next to the fear, to also listen to the longing. Uh, I certainly know from my my own life, when I made some choices which could have felt fearful, I don't know, leaving a successful quote unquote career at McKinsey to do my own stuff, and then at some point leaving that stuff that was successful to go to the research for the book for three years, not getting income and stuff. You know, that, so there have been a number of sort of big decisions. And what helped me a lot is next to actually listening to that fear is also just to listen to the longing, to the stuff that wanted to emerge in me. And there was a moment where it was just, hey, this is what I have to do, whatever the fear there is. And so I think it's, it's interesting to work on, on both levels, question that fear and what does it tell me about my identity and about you know, some of my hidden assumptions and some of the stuff that's important to me. But then also just what is it that I just ultimately, if I really listen well, feel called to do, there's no escape. That's, that's really the, the place I need to go. And that then certainly gives me courage and strength to go beyond those, those fears. Um, so I think that that was a nice segue to your question about, about listening, right? And how do we create these, these listening spaces? Um, and I mean, we're lucky, I think we're, we're, I think in just a sort of a face of consciousness that makes listening easier than I think 10 or 15 years ago. I think, you know, stuff like meditation and yoga, you know, has, is becoming more mainstream and some of these, you know, Eastern practices are, are, are making it into the mainstream. And, and even leaders now often feel it's okay to do these things. And, um, and next to that, I think we, we now know how to create safe space. I mean, there's, a, you know, there's enough consultants, coaches out there who know how to take a group, an executive committee, and take them to a deeper space if they just will, will book a day or two in their agendas and go off site. You know, we, we, we now know how to do these things. And what typically happens is that after an initial moment of a little bit of uncomfort of like, oh, where, where are we going here? And, you know, we're not used to talking to each other in that way. You know, if there's a skillful facilitator, very often then that longing will come out. You know, that conversation like Bill, you know, with his brother, you know, that probably wanted to be happening for a while. You know, that similar conversations, you know, have been building up in people and people actually in many ways wanted to have them. And finally, the, the space has been created and, and the, the facilitator creates the, 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 the safety for these conversations to happen. So, I, you know, I, I think we're, we have enough tools now to, to make this happen. So, as, you know, as long as, you know, we know how to book them in the time of, of people to have a skillful facilitator, they can happen. Um, my, my friend that you can't see here ne next to me told me a wonderful story this morning of an organization that he's been working with where the top leadership, he was facilitating it. He started it, but then they actually told him, get out of the room, now we, we do this on our own. And, and they had a long conversation and then texted him at 11 p.m. at night, to, 
still don't come back. We're still in a conversation. And, and they, they texted him at eight o'clock in the morning next day uh, to come back. And, and they had decided as an, ex as an executive team that they would collectively resign Be because they had decided that they were the impediment to making the change happen. And so they, they then addressed their 800 people and saying, hey, by the way, we all collectively resigned. And you know, we'll be caretakers, but you guys make the change and you just self-organize it. Put some control in there so that we don't freak out, uh, but, but, but you will do it. And, and so that's just the, the kind of power that we can have when we finally have deep and meaningful conversations. When we finally start listening to, to what's, what's staring, what, what actually wants to, wants to come out. Certainly can't top that one. Uh, uh, the person didn't even have to be in the room to start the listening. That's good. <laughs> I haven't quite reached that stage yet. Maybe that'll be the next time I can leave the room after five minutes and we'll see what happens. That's be good. Um, well, I just, I can't, I can't top the story. Uh, and so I just very briefly, uh, I mean, to say in slightly different words, something I said this morning, uh, that in a sense, our education until we're 21 is, is about taking in words from the outside world. And in a way, our education after 21 could be about listening for nonverbal experience from the inside world or the between world, uh, not only my inside, but your inside and, and uh, the space in between us. Um, and I was lucky enough to, uh, to stumble upon uh, a discipline, uh, an adult discipline for listening, a spiritual movement that didn't just have meditation, but gave you jobs on Sunday and you did various normal things uh, like build a big rock fireplace, uh, but also with an inner listening task the whole time uh, and uh, other various disciplines, uh, all of which can only be done uh, by through a form of active listening into yourself and into others. So um, this is not, this is not a discipline that one learns in a master's program in two years or a doctoral program in five. Um, it's more like the Confucian discipline, and I can't remember it exactly, but where Confucius says something like, and then at the age of 50, I learned how to see, and then at the age of 60, I learned how to listen. I mean, these, these take decades uh, of work, and of course, uh, where it leads to I always knew this rationally, but I had never felt it fully until sometime in my 60s, I suddenly realized, oh my God, this means that I'm going to be in an even more intense inquiry as I grow older. I sort of assumed things would just calm down and I'd be like able to sort of stop the, all the inquiry business because there wouldn't really be any more, but it, it's not true. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the leaders who are wanting to make these transformations in organizations have a tremendous power in their role modeling. And, and, and really, their role modeling is, is as powerful as any decisions that they will take. Because we, we look at these leaders so closely. And just as Bill was saying, it's not a one person job. You know, it's very quickly for that leader to find allies you know, who role model the same things and then pour a spotlight onto them. And so I think a, a big part of, of the role of, of leaders in this transformation is to try and increase their self-awareness, have a few trusted allies that they, that they ask to be sort of the fool to the king that tells them the truth about where they are role modeling well and, and where they might be sabotaging what they're trying to achieve. Um, and, and, and so that's such a such an absolutely critical component. And, and yesterday, I, I, I was having a discussion with a leader wanting to take his organization's direction. And one of the things we discussed is how he could perhaps uh, do more blogging and more stuff to to share stories 
because he was telling me lots of interesting stories of, hey, here's wonderful new stuff that's happening. And here we're still totally in the old. And how powerful it would be, you know, if he didn't just tell that to me, but if, if almost every day or every second or third day, you would just write short, short, short stories um, that, that exemplified role modeling the, the new and, and, and not the old um, in, in the organization. So doing it himself, but pu putting a spotlight onto, onto some other stuff. And he had a fascinating discussion around, he didn't feel very comfortable naming when people were still doing the absolute wrong thing because he didn't want to shame people in front of the whole organization. And we had an interesting discussion about, you know, what does wholeness really mean? And, you know, and, and why can't we talk about stuff where we're in the old, in the old, why can't we just very simply have a discussion of saying, Hey, we're all still learning. And here, let me tell you an example of something that really did go the way we don't want to see it anymore. And, and, and just be, have very open conversations around, around that. Well, but See, yeah, good. Uh, I mean, the role modeling is so critical because any statement that's made by somebody with power that is discordant from their practice, incongruent with their practice, is going to be disbelieved and mocked and create cynicism in the organization. I mean, the issue is to transform the practice of the organization. And, you know, I often uh, imagine the, the word practice to myself. I say it th three times, practice, practice, practice. And the first practice is uh, all lowercase. And uh, that's when we, at the beginning, we think we just practice occasionally and we'll get better at something. And then the second practice, I capitalize the P uh, because you suddenly realize that practices are important. And it's really critical that you get the practice right, not just the words. Uh, and then the third practice, I capitalize all the letters because it's the recognition that you are constantly practicing. Uh, it's just that you're not aware of your practice. Uh, so, And it's really important uh, if you are meant to have an influence in a larger setting uh, that that your practice be congruent with your beliefs, because otherwise it's not going to have, it's going to have exactly the reverse influence that you mean it to have. Question. Well, um, uh, there's so many different kinds of examples, but just to give um, uh, one way that I have worked with a number of senior teams uh, is uh, to, uh, first of all, ask the uh, CEO if he will uh, decentralize the leadership of the team to the rest of the team. So, uh, and usually if it's a five or six person team, um, you can in fact distinguish at least five different leadership roles, creating the agenda, managing the meeting, following up on whether decisions are made, being a process intervener in the meeting itself if it's not going well, and uh, perhaps uh, being an assessment leader who will uh, take five minutes at the end of each meeting to find a creative way of checking in with people whether the meeting really went well or not. And then you give the leaders feedback every third meeting about how they're practicing their leadership roles. Then you change who's playing which role. They each develop because, uh, you know, you can play the agenda creation role in more or less creative ways. Uh, somebody will just take over, okay, send me in your agenda items before the meeting, but there's much more creative ways of, of thinking of creating the agenda. So you get different models. So everybody is getting feedback on their exercise of the leadership roles, and the CEO takes the coaching role with regard to the others. So, um, uh, and so usually finds that he's being consulted more for his advice in helping the others with their leadership role and what are relevant issues on the larger board and competitive agenda. So it creates feedback within every meeting uh, uh, with regard to the development of new skills and capacities. One. I've evolved, I've evolved a little bit from my 
more extremist stance, I think, when I wrote the book, which was, don't even try. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, in the beginning, I, I came really from this perspective, you know, that whole system change only happens when the, really, when the CEO and the board really want it to happen. Um, I still think that is true. Uh, but I, I don't think that that should prevent you from doing all sorts of things if you feel called to do them. Um, and I, especially when some people tell me, hey, I'm, I'm about to leave my organization, I can't take it any longer. Um, then I tell them, hey, wh what about the alternative of just staying around and doing everything you feel you want to do? And perhaps it won't go well, and perhaps people will fire, I mean, it will go very well, but people will fire you, which is anyway what you were gonna do with yourself. So, you know, at least you will have, uh, you'll have had great fun, you'll have learned a huge amount, you will have gotten your identity out there as being somebody who's doing something new, you will have built relationship around that, and maybe that will bring you your next job, which will be much more in line with who you want to be. Um, so I, I now start to, you know, encourage people, um, but I, I tend to ask him two questions. The first question is, um, how much risk are you willing to take? So are you in the extreme of, I, I'm willing to be fired on this or not? I think it's just an important question to ask yourself to decide how far you want to go in, in, in playing and experimenting. Um, and the second question is, how long do you want to stay in your current role? Because if you know that you're going to leave in six months or a year, and that probably a more traditional person will take over, you know, there isn't much point. And so I sometimes encourage people to say, you know, will you be willing to forgive, forego your potential, whatever, next promotion or something and, and, and really stay around for three, four years, five years, six years and try something. Um, and there's quite some things when you start to think about it that you can do. So for instance, around the whole wholeness piece, you can facilitate and do really beautiful stuff. And, and most likely your hierarchy won't, won't mind too much. They, they might not even know about it or they, you know. Um, but even on some of the more structural things, there, there are some interesting things you can do. Um, uh, one thing is one guy called, when I had a conversation, called it the shit umbrella. And I, I like that expression. He said, like, you know, just put the umbrella and a lot of the shit, you know, stops there. Um, and there's quite some stuff that you can do. So, for instance, uh, you know, I don't know, you have to play in all sorts of budget processes. And you submit the numbers to the top, but maybe people don't really mind that you don't casca cascade the whole thing down. And you go into much more creative ways with people below, just as an example. Um, or let's say another thing that people, like, you know, when there's a direct report of yours that needs to be that changed position and you need to re appoint a new direct report, how about instead of you naming him, you ask the people below, so two levels down, to write a job description and to interview that person? You know, most of the time HR doesn't need to know about it, but it changes something fundamental in, in the way things are done in the organization. You know, or in the way you do performance evaluation, there are much more soulful ways to do them. In the end, you still hand in the paperwork with HR, you know, with whatever needs to be ticked, but you can do it within your own teams in much more soulful ways. And so there are really many things that you can do if you really come to think about it um, that can exist within this, the existing system. Um, but there will be frictions and it will be tiring and you will be squeezed between one part of the organization that does it one way and another part. So be, be aware of that and be you know, con willing to consider how much risk you want to take and how much energy you're willing to invest in something that, that might be tiring as well as, as fun and exhilarating. So that's my current, my current answer, the, the current state I've come to. Bill? Uh, I'm remembering uh, how really a vast organizational change uh, came about in a mental health institution where the lower orders uh, had no control over anything, but they called a meeting uh, at lunch uh, about how to repaint the lunchroom. Um, and uh, nobody would give them the right to call this meeting uh, or the right to repaint the lunchroom. Uh, they proposed that, uh, that the people who came to lunch to talk about it could volunteer to come in over the weekend and paint the room. Um, they didn't ask anybody's permission. Uh, and they did end up repainting the room. But it was just the beginning of the lunch meetings. <laughs> different people called different lunch meetings about different things. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, 
the higher ups uh, began hearing about it, but they, people had creative ideas that uh, made people happier at work, and so quite a few of them were uh, accepted. Uh, but there's that, and then on the other extreme, another possibility is, uh, I love all of Frederick's suggestions, but uh, is to find two people at work that uh, share some interest uh, with you in the possibility of organizational change and have a regular meeting for dinner once every two weeks, once every three weeks, uh, talk about specific situations you encounter and have difficulty with uh, with one another and and listen to alternative possibilities for how to handle them. Uh, and there's a number of different books and articles that uh, Haiti and others of us can make available to you, but that, that can help with structuring such exercises. So one begins to uh, transform oneself for organizational change um, with the help of a, of a couple of other people at work who more or less know the same situation. Thank you. And I think I'm going to come in with one other story I heard from from someone I met some time ago and she came into an organization where people would sit where their doors closed and not really ever talk to each other if there wasn't something that was really work related. And she started to go into the coffee room that never was used and the first week she was sitting there by herself. No one else would join but eventually more and more people started to join and it became something like a really important part of at two o'clock every day they would meet in this coffee room and that's where they would discuss those very important things. So it can be really, really small things that you go in and change very consciously and it can transform the organization or the culture in a way that can be more collaborative, even though you don't have to be the, the big boss. So with this, I'd like to say thank you to you, Frederick. I don't really know where to say hi. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Frederick. Yeah. From everybody, I think. <laughs>